on tonight's episode, movie star and film producer Jasmine Lewis. Welcome to the Carl Jackson Podcast. I am delighted that you're with us tonight. Tonight is a special show because we have uh, a movie star and we have a film producer and we have a musician and we have a singer. I don't know if she sings, but we're going to find out tonight. Um, Jasmine Lewis, just so much that she's done in her career and, and she's taken an amazing career path. Her husband is an attorney, great guy. Uh, she has a great family, great son. So I just wanted to dive into some of that stuff because I've seen some of her videos on Instagram recently of her cooking, which we will talk about tonight. And I just was kind of interested because there are so many, so many sides to her that I didn't know. And sometimes when we have friends, we don't ever take the time to get to know them and get to know things about them. So that's what this podcast is about. It's just me having fun as a filmmaker, talking to people that I admire, people that I want to look learn from or, or people that I look up to and people that I want to get to know better. So uh, when we come back from break, we will dive right into it. Uh, we, re we actually recorded this um, in my office, one of my offices, because we're still in pandemic. And although things are a lot better, um, it's still not quite, you know, where it should be. So we're still taking precautions. And you know, we just want to do the right thing. But at some point, I'm hoping that all of my guests that I've had this season, season four, will be able to actually talk with me either here at the studio or at some cool location that, you know, we choose to uh, record at. Uh, and quick shout out to the people who are watching on Select TV, television provider Select TV. And want to say hi, how you doing? Thank you for watching us, getting to know our network, CJC. Um, and a lot of you have asked, like, why do I always say the name of the television provider? Well, I do that because I want to obviously have some form of a record of the times in our lives that we recorded these things. You know, these things in the moment are cool, but they're actually cooler when you can listen to them or watch them 30 years from 30 years from now or 20 years from now or 10 years from now. So it's kind of a way to document what was going on. So, I, you know, I, I do it. And it, I think it's important that we, you know, make it known when great, amazing things are happening. Uh, as many of you know, I own the network. So uh, for me, it's just about building this. This is all a new journey for me as I go from filmmaking. Well, I still make films, but I'm going into another direction in addition to what I'm already doing, which is making films. So I always document. So that's why I do that. And I just wanted to make that known and in case people were asking questions about that. So when we come back, Jasmine Lewis, I can't wait for you guys to watch this episode and watch this interview. Original movies, original series, original concerts, and more. CJC, one network sharing the world. What are you looking for? Hope. Guidance. Spiritual enlightenment. What are you looking for? Family, peace, financial security, love, time. To the great city of Los Angeles, we want to welcome you to programming that will help lead you to the light. 24 hours a day, original movies, original series, music, and more.
CJC. Always positive. Welcome to the Carl Jackson Podcast. I am delighted that you have joined us today. And today I have a very special guest. I've known her for about, I guess, four or five, maybe four or five years. Um, and we were in talks about doing a TV show. Actually, we got to the point where we were about to start production, but we can't. We're still in talks. We're always in talks about something. We're always in talks about something, right. Well, keep but, going with your introduction. I just had to put that in. <laughs> It hasn't happened, and I'll just take full responsibility for it, okay? Um, <laughs> if, because if I don't, that's going to be another whole conversation. Anyway, without sure. further ado, welcome movie star and now film producer and musician and cook, Miss <laughs> Jasmine Lewis Kelly. <laughs> Hi. <How are> you? <laughs> Your hands. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. So I'm good. I, I, I want to ask you a couple questions. Uh, okay. First of all, here's the thing. I'm going to try to get, get this all done within 45 minutes because I have so many questions I want to ask you. Uh, okay. But I'm going to try to move fast. Um, so I want to start with where are you from? Where are you from? I'm born in Columbus, Ohio, raised just out of, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. And you have brothers and sisters, right? I have two sisters, older sisters, both of them. Okay. And okay. so talk a little bit about the music. How did you get involved in, for, for those of you that don't know, she plays a mean bass guitar. Mm -hmm. And you used to play, well, you know what, I'm gonna let you do it, do the talking. So how did you get started in music and who did you, who do, who are the people that you've played for? Um, I got started because my sisters and I just, you know, in our household, we had to play piano and we starting at three years old, we had to take piano lessons. So I started on piano and, and, um, moved on to all string instruments after that. So, um, I play almost everything except I don't play wind instruments. I play everything else, but no wind instruments, oddly. Um, my sister does, but I don't. Uh, and so then how I got started in music is my, my uncle, my mom's brother is a jazz musician, a pretty famous jazz musician. He's, he's passed now, but he was pretty famous. And just like with his kids, his, all of his nieces or nephews or whatever, he would take us to the studio with him when we were really little. And, you know, just, he was a drummer. So we just watch him play uh, for hours whoever he was playing for he was a session musician but he was also a touring musician and you know they didn't he as a jazz musician you do a lot of club circuits but in different parts of the country so he pretty much did that all his life and he would all of my sisters and his kids he's got four of them none of them really we all had to play but none of them really loved it except me so when they were allowed to kind of fall off as they got older because i'm the youngest and kind of quit I didn't, I just started gravitating to different instruments. I, I, you know, picking up new ones. And he took me to the studio one day when I was about, so about 11 or 12. Uh, it was just me, cause I was the only one that wanted to go. And he was just doing another one of his jazz sessions. And so I always sit down, but I had been in the studio a lot. So I would roam around on my own, you know, do my thing. And I walked next door and that studio, that particular room was locked out by parliament. So George Clinton was there and Bootsy Collins was there. And I knew exactly who these people were. And it was interesting because my sisters being so much older than me exposed me to music and everything way before I'm sure it was appropriate. So I was a funketeer by like four and I was very clear what to do. You know, that's, you know, so I was exposed. So I knew who it was and I was just so excited. They didn't notice a little 11 year old and I was really small. So just sort of wandering to their room and I just sat in the corner and I just listened and listened and listened. And I remember it was George that came over to me and said something like, oh, how did you get in here? Or, Who are you or whatever? And I was like, my uncle Frank is next door. And he knew, cause my uncle Frank was a famous jazz musician. Well, he knew who he was. And he was like, oh, that's your uncle. 
And then Booty came over and I was looking at his face and I was, I guess I had, a, I don't know the look on my face, but it must have been a very lustful look because he said, you like that bass? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and he picked it up and he said, if you can come back in two weeks and know how to play it, you can keep it. And it was a Fender Precision Jazz fretless bass, 1967. Obviously, I came back two weeks later and I knew every note that he played on every Parliament song after that. And I played it for him and he let, I still have that bass. Wait, 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 wait. So, you were what age? Uh, between 11 and 12, right in there. And you knew every note. Oh, I went home and learned it. I, I, he gave me two weeks. Wow. And I learned every note. So did you start, when did you start playing professionally then? Um, right after that, it's not, you know, being in Ohio, the, the, the music world is very small. It's super popular and famous, but it's very small. So everybody kind of knows everybody. And anybody that's doing anything or anything different, all people from Ohio, from, you know, Roger Trauben and Zap to the Ohio players, everybody knows about it. You know, Gerald Levert, I mean, they could, everybody's there. So being a female who was young, um, that could play like a man, but in a skirt and heels is very sought after by about the age of 15, 16. So that's when I started touring because I graduated from high school. You early, started so. touring? Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. 16, almost 16. So you graduated from high school at 15 and you started touring around that age. Wow. No wonder I can't negotiate this, this contract properly with you. You way too smart. <laughs> 16. So who, who, who were you touring with? Well, the, the first, I mean, everybody from the, give me, the list. Players, give me, give me the list. It's hard to give you the whole list. Cause I, most of them, I forgot I toured for 11 and a half straight years straight without coming off a tour bus. So from basically 15 to 25, 26, somewhere in there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah very young. Um, and I just, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. That life on the road is, it's another life, you know, so. So why I, the bass, why the bass? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Okay, so okay. you could play a lot of mu instruments. Why was the bass such a big thing for you? What was it about the bass guitar that made you want to play that? You know, I, I could have toured with any instrument. I chose to tour as a bass player because bass is my favorite instrument. The reason it's my favorite instrument is because basically without me, everything else doesn't exist. I'm the bottom, I'm the, I'm the what holds, I, you know, it's the drummer and the, and the bassist that hold the, re, the beat in the yep. room. It's James really Brown crazy. taught us that. Absolutely. He taught Absolutely. us that, Doc. But anybody that knows music knows that. Any real musician knows that. You can get away without a, key, a keyboard. You can get away with almost everything. But you've got to have a bass. And I liked being an anchor. I liked being usually the youngest on stage, obviously. Most likely as a musician a, a, and a singer, because I, I would always, they could book me one rate, two things, sing it, uh, background vocals and um, bass guitar. So, so you, could, you, you can sing as well? Oh, yeah. I made a living as a singer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't want to be an artist. That's another story, but. So, 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 okay. So what was that like? That's to tour? Like bass. So what was that like to tour as a, as a young woman? I'm sure with a, mom, with a lot of guys. So a lot of band members. Yeah. Well, no, because you know what? It's interesting because, well, first of all, my mom was with me for the first couple of years. Cause I was underage, obviously, but more than that, they were so much older than me. Most of them looked at me like a daughter. I didn't really get hit on because those were not like, it wasn't like I was 16 and they was 24. You know what I mean? I, I was 16 and there were 54. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, right. that's my, that looked like my daughter, possibly my granddaughter. I'm not even, I was very, they were very protective of me though. Everyone, every man was very protective of me. So for 11 years, what was that like on the road? And why did you get off the road? What it was like on the road was 
really exhilarating. Really, I learned a lot. I saw everything. I, I, I am who I am because of those experiences, for sure. Um, and it was, it was, it was great. It was, it was an, ex it was a once in a lifetime experience. Who, who gets to do that? Who gets to travel the world as a teenager doing what you love with your, your own musical icons. I'm playing behind people I listen to on records. You know what I mean? So I'm playing those songs. So it was, uh, it was, a, it's, it was an experience. It's something I'll never forget. Na name experience. a few of the, the bands that you play with. Roger Chauvin and Zapp, I toured with the longest. That was my people. That was my people. Roger. You didn't know that? I thought you knew no, that. No, I thought I knew JT. Yes. You did. I, I knew JT. I didn't tour with him. I just did his record and then I played the song. So he was like, Can you do Soul Train with me? And because he wanted me to go on the road with him. I didn't want to go on the road. So I said, I'll play it, I'll play it, I'll record it, and then I'll do it on Soul Train and then spot dates here, but I'm not, I ain't because by that time you were kind of getting tired of it i was done i was pretty much done right was, right so so let me ask you this so why so okay so being a music, musician a singer do you write music too yeah, write, yeah. i've been writing some, yeah write songs so what brought you what made you pivy from music to to acting i woke up after many years in the middle of the night, I vividly remember sitting straight up on the tour bus in my bed. And I didn't know where I was or who I was out on the road with. It was like instant amnesia. And I, I don't know, I, it came back to me, you know, later, but the fact that I woke up that confused, I knew, I had known that I was really exhausted, really exhausted. Because these groups, like if you go out with, Ro Roger don't ever come off the road, but if you go out with like, I did spot stuff with Gladys Knight. And I did the Bud Fest when she was with Whitney Houston and all that stuff. And then their, her band goes down when she goes down. I hop to the next thing. So I never stopped working. And because I was like, why am I so much more exhausted than everybody else? Um, that was the reason. And so it was physically taking a toll on me. And not only that. Wait. And I, I was just think, thinking, and not only that, you are a, a female black basis which was a commodity an anomaly right wow so you just got exhausted i was just tired yeah and i was like what can i do and you know i'd never entertainment is what i did i'd never done anything else my degree in college is in music that's my degrees are in music so it's like i either go come off the road and start teaching or I go do something else that doesn't require a resume because I've never had a normal person job, which is what I should have had probably. So I literally just said, I'm going to be an actor. And no one said back in the nineties that you couldn't just say you're going to be an actor and do it. So nobody told me I couldn't. So I did. <laughs> That's it, literally exactly how it happened. I came off the road a week later. I was working for a kid. I was working with a kid who was, he's an actor, but he was, he's a singer too. Young. He was like 11, maybe 10. And um, so I knew him as, as an actor, but I was working on his record for him and his mom is his manager. And I just called her up and I said, I, I wanna be an actor. I think I can do this. And she was like, okay. And I knew she managed her son and he did well. Um, so she said, well, come on over and read for me. And I was so green. I didn't even know what like, I didn't even know what that meant. You know, I wasn't an actor in that way. So I went down that day and I read for her and she was like, I'm gonna manage you. And I was like, okay. The next day, she had me have a meeting with an agent, the very next day. And, uh, but it's just small, there's just one guy, you know, one phone, one room. And I went and met with him and he was like, okay, I'm gonna represent you. I was like, he was like, well, where's your resume? I was like, I don't have a resume. He said, well, let me see your headshot. I said, I don't have a headshot. <laughs> he was like, well, what do you have? I said, just me, do you want me or not? Because in music, you approach things differently. I didn't know that that's not what you do to an agent. Like, right. you, know, like you want me or not, look what's up. You know? right. Which is kind of apparently how I was, but I didn't recognize that at the time. And, and he was like, okay. Hey, Jasmine, Jasmine, you, you still that way. I look, right? I know. I'm working on it. So I've been told. Uh, so first yeah, hand. Uh, so. I know firsthand, trust me, people. <laughs> so bad. I'm, I'm doing better. 
No, I love it. You know, what's listening to you talk, I'm learning so much. I mean, even though we've been friends for a couple minutes, I, I, I'm learning things about you and your personality. And now I'm understanding it. You know what I mean? Because it makes sense, more sense. Oh, it makes a whole lot more sense because you come from a background where you basically did everything how you wanted to do it. You did it Frank Sinatra, your way. And when yeah, you have someone one of my <laughs> and so that I think that is an amazing thing to know so young. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To know yeah. what but you, you know, want. It also I think hardened me a bit though, because I was a female and a young female who actually looked younger than I even was. So I was that, but in a man's world. So I, if I didn't really show up, show up, no one knew I was there. So I learned to show up in a room. So what was and your- I gone far. <laughs> right, right. Oh, absolutely. So what was your first uh, gig as, a, as an actress? So, so the guy that's, Continuing the story because it's and, it, and I job. hope it's not, and I hope it's not how to be a player, right? It is not okay because no. I want to talk about that in, the, in a second. And we will, well, we'll talk about it as much as we can. But yes, I went to the I went to the agency. I read for him. He asked me for my resume, my headshot. I didn't have it, and I was like, well, "So we gonna what, what we gonna do? We gonna rock now?" He was like, "Yep, yeah, cool." So the next day, he called me in the morning and he said, "I have an audition for you," and I said, "Okay." And he said, it's for Martin. Well, I liked the show, Martin. This was the very next day. And he said, you know, so he gave me the address. What time am I supposed to be there? He's like, you have an audition. I was like, okay. I didn't know enough to be nervous. So I wasn't. You know what I mean? Like, I was so ignorant. And I was like, Psh, it ain't music. Ain't nobody going in there. You got to hold some notes. You don't have to play nothing. You don't have to read music. You don't have to do none of that. So who can't walk in there and say some stuff on the, on the paper? I can do that. That was my cavalier attitude at the time. I mean, just thinking about it now. Makes I'm thinking me about it because you, you're not much different now. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you said I had grown and matured. You know, you, you know, I'll tell you, I'm being funny right now, but I love it. I love it. Okay, all right, continue. So I read, I went in there, I did the audition, I left. I was just one line and I left and he called me a few hours, my manager called me a few hours later and I was cooking. That's what I was doing, I was cooking. And I was busy, so I didn't want to really hear it too much because it was the end of the day. It was, I remember it was 6.15 PM. I'll never forget that. Cause I was like, who, this is it. Ain't nobody working right now. Why are, who is ever this is calling me? I answered it and she said, you booked the job. This is how green I was. I didn't know what that meant. I wasn't even sure what she was talking about. I was like, what job, what are you talking about? She was like, you remember when you went in for Martin? I was like, oh yeah, she said, you got it. I said, awesome. Let me call you back because I'm about to burn the chicken. And I hung up the phone and I didn't call her back for hours. What I didn't know is I had to be at work the next day in the morning. I didn't call her back to like midnight. And she was like, well, you, you, yeah, I'm glad you did, but you have to go to work tomorrow. So I booked my very first audition on Martin, very last season. I had one line. I was Pina of Pina and Colada. And I kind of just didn't stop working after that. Um, after that, you just probably did a lot of television. I did a lot of television, but I did some, I think I, I had done, it was UPN days back then. So you could literally do a different show a week, every week. Yeah. They had homeboys, so, not I, a I, space, I Malcolm and Eddie. And yeah. Right. And so we did, I did that. And then probably about a month later, I got my first independent movie, which is a very small a movie called, I think, Broken Bars. Very small character, but like I had to be in a, a poolside, like bikini and say some stuff. I was like a gangster's girlfriend or whatever. It was fun. Um, and then I did another small independent. And then right after that, I booked How to Be a Player. Now, that goes to my film. So, that was when? What did well, you say? Well, it was shot in 1996. It came out in 1997. 97. Okay. So, I have a little story, a little confession, a little. Um, fan. I'm going to be a fanboy for a second. So there were two women, okay. two black women. And I think a lot of brothers would agree with this because I didn't realize how big of a cult following you had with black men until like the yeah. last year. Oh, it's big. Trust me. You have a whole I, underground. I, oh. I, 
oh, trust me, it's crazy. So, yeah, we talk about it after the show. But listen, there are two <laughs> there are two women that to me made cinema history in terms of connecting to a point where men were like, oh, like I want to date this, you know? And that was uh right. that was Halle Berry in The Last Boy Scout. When that movie came out, when we saw her in that movie, brothers was losing their mind. It was like, oh my God. And then the second was when you were in the in the t-shirt um, or the or the male shirt. The button up shirt. Um and how to be a player. Oh my God. I I was sitting in the theater when that when that movie came out. And I remember vividly, I sat in the theater and I was like, who is that? Like, what the fudge? <laughs> what the fudge, man? Like, that was, I mean, th those two, I think, movies were, were they're going to be like classic legendary moments for black female cinema. I love it. I'll take it. It, I was I was happy to be a part of it. Yeah, man. So I know you can't go in too much because of whatever. So just talk about just the whole experience in terms of acting. Like, what was that like for you? I learned a lot on that movie. That was my first. I had done those two independent films, and I'd done TV. But that was my first, I'd say, like, studio movie, like, bigger situation with more people involved as far as the powers that be. Um, and I, at the time, was on a TV show as a series regular. And I, I booked my first series regular like a year into my career. So it was kind of an anomaly. But what it made me was not pressed because I had a job. I had a really good job. <laughs> You know what I mean? So I remember auditioning for the movie and I knew a couple people that were going to be in it. So I was like, oh, I want to work with them. That's going to be fun. And it didn't, it was, it was fun and it, the scenes were good, but I learned that not getting deep into it. I learned that as a woman, as a woman of color in this industry, you can't be so desperate that you will throw out your dignity, your scruples, all of that. You're, you gotta lose your mind for just a second just to get the, it's not worth it. So it made me not pressed. Me not being pressed made some of the people that had some power at the time not very happy. Because I said, I'm not going to give you this piece of paper that you've gotten from all of the other women on this set. They've signed off their rights. I have not, I don't intend to. So if you would like to fire me, I actually have another job to go to. And they said, they want, you don't have to do it. I said, okay. And not getting too into it, I was tricked into it. Then a, 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 assured, someone assured me that there were certain portions of a movie that wouldn't be released because they couldn't. They were unable to, and they did it anyway. So what I learned is don't trust people that say they can be trusted. Find your circle, keep it small, and use your attorneys. That's what I learned. I came out of it just fine, though. <laughs> so I'm okay with that. Because the result was okay for me. So the experience wasn't necessarily a pleasant experience because of that. Oh. Right. It wasn't a pleasant experience, no. No, most of the experience of doing that movie was. Right. There was that moment that right. wasn't. right. The good thing about it is, is that I didn't know about that moment till the movie was edited and about to come out. So the nice. so whole experience was great to me. Shooting. So you so the, so the scenes that we saw weren't necessarily supposed to be in the movie. Some of them, no. Wow. So I didn't know that they were. So I didn't have a bad experience until I saw the movie. So how did you feel when you saw the movie? Now keep in mind, I'm 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 not being a fan asking. I'm now because I know the story. You've told me the yeah. whole the story. Thing. Right. You told me that. But when you saw the movie, what is what was going through your mind, considering that this is kind of like your big studio right. film and you're excited, you're telling your people, your fam, 
What goes through your mind when you see that? Well, here's what's interesting. This is something you don't know about me. I don't, I don't know if you've ever, we've ever talked about it or not, but I didn't do that with this movie. Like I didn't have anything to walk back from with regret when my family saw it because I didn't hype it up. I don't tell my family and most of my friends when I'm working or what's coming out, we just don't talk about that. So most of them didn't know. So I was able to see it earlier and um, obviously wasn't happy. So, you know, my support for certain things wasn't there, but I didn't have to worry about what my family and friends would say because most of them didn't even know that I'd done it. <laughs> and here's the thing. I don't think that they would have cared either way. I think they would have said, whatever you did was your choice, but kind of wasn't. So what, after that film, what was your, were your next big film for you that you consider your next big film? Because you've done so many. Like, it's, we couldn't, we, I can't possibly talk about them all. But what was uh, your next big thing for you that you felt was like, yes? I would probably, mm, there was two things. I was already, on, I told you I was on Good News. I was on a, a UPM show. So that was a series regular. That was during that. And then that went. And that's with Terrence. That's with uh, That's not with Terrence Howard, right? No, Terrence. They were on our sister show, Sparks. The sister show, Sparks. Same, okay. same soundstage. We're next door to each other, so that's our sister show. That's okay. where Terrence was, and Robin Givens. That's why we've been so close for so long, because that was 1997. So after that show, I think the next after the movie and the show was over, I'd say the next big TV thing was an ABC show called Line of Fire. It was a drama. And my character was written to be, at the time, a 40-year-old white woman. And they got me, you know. Right. So, you know, but 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, it was that was that was a nice platform because I had not done the crossover platform yet. You know, ABC, CBS, NBC. I hadn't really done that yet. A little bit, but not really. So that show and the next movie was a Robert Townsend movie called Blacklisted. Oh yeah. yeah. First time I'd gotten to work to work with Robert Townsend. What was that like to work with Robert? He seemed like he's cool. I've only met him like twice. And we're still good friends. It, he is so awesome. We we worked together. I learned a lot from him just being present on set. He he is a master at controlling this environment without seeming like a controlling person. You know? I don't know how he masters it. He's one of the few that can do it. He just does it with a smile on his face, I guess. I don't know. Um, so that was, the, that was the next, I'd say, bigger movie that I had done. And then let's talk about the barbershop. Oh, you want to, you need a break? No, no, no. I was like, I thought I heard Brian chewing behind me. I see him. I see his head moving up and down. The, there, right? Yeah, I saw him moving up and down the street, the, the kitchen, his head. <laughs> All I saw was, I, it must have been good because he was slowly moving. So I guess he was enjoying it. <laughs> Whatever you was cooking. <laughs> I'm like, I'm here and I was like, what's going on back there? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so let's 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 fast forward to the barbershop movies. Huge movies. Yeah. Ice Cube's wife. There was talks of even doing a TV show, I think. I don't know if that's true, but we did a TV show. We weren't in it, but we did okay, a TV show. Okay, gotcha. So yeah. talk a little bit about um the barbershop experience and what, what was that like for your life to see a movie gets so huge. I mean, you've done three of them now. You've done three of those films. I've right? done all three, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah. huge yeah. franchise. I mean, hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars. So what was, what was that experience like for you? We were one of the first um, urban movies to break 25 million in the opening week of a, of a box office. We Incredible. One of so we kind of set record. Was like, was amazing, right. I know. I was like, that was, that was kind of incredible. And Black excellence, was man. A new director at that time. It was a very first like big job and he just crushed it like a lot of people got a lot of opportunity from those movies you know so you know it was fun um it was a, a process getting that job like I apparently I didn't know this at the time but apparently my character was very sought after I did know that everybody and their brother and their sister came in Anybody put on a wig, came in for the Jennifer Palmer character. Um, it had gotten down to a few, at the time, way bigger names than my name, because that was 2000, 2000. yeah, 2000, because it came out in 2001. So, you know, I was happy. 
um, I didn't take, I took all auditions very, very serious at that time. I still do, but then. And that one I just didn't take serious because I was like, ain't nobody, everybody, I know who's going to get this job. I can name four of them right now. And I was like, that's so why I said to my agent several times, are you sure you, because uh, please don't waste my time. I was like, I'm good. I don't need to go in because you got to learn lines and put on makeup. And it's not like an easy thing. Like a man could just go, okay, I'm going to change my shirt and go do this and then come on back home. We got to do stuff. And I was like, there's not a shot for me. He was like, just go, just show up. And I'll never forget. I went to my, the first audition for that movie. And it was, it was nighttime for like seven o'clock at night. So it was dark. It was pouring, raining outside, pouring, like torrential downpour, not like a sprinkle. And I was like, it never rains. In I ain't supposed to go. This is a sign. And my best friend, Kevin, came over. He was already at my house anyway. And we were going to go get dinner. I was like, let's just go, Kevin. Let's just go to dinner. Forget this. And he was like, it's on our way. And the audition was on our way to dinner. And I, I was like, I don't want to be out in the rain. He was like, you're going to be in the rain anyway, because we got to go to dinner. So I was like, fine. Right. I'm not going to put on clothes. I remember taking my hair and doing just what I twisted it up, stuck a pin in it. I didn't have on any makeup. That's how not serious I took it. I grabbed the sides. I hadn't even looked at them. In the car, he drove. I, I scanned him. I was like, cool. I didn't take it serious at all. I got there. I was, it was so dark. And it was, like I said, it was pouring raining. People were running around with umbrellas. And I was looking around. And I was like, I don't know where to go in. I'm going to go in that door. That was the wrong door. So I come in soaking wet in the middle of someone's actual audition. Because I went into the back as opposed to the front. Oh, so I'm no. standing there. Now I'm dripping. Oh, no. <laughs> I remember making some kind of joke because how do you explain that? And, and what I've come to find out were the producers. I didn't know even know that they were the producers at the time. They start cracking up laughing at my joke because I'm like, I'm just trying to backpedal out of the room and get out of her audition. I go sit down. They call me in. Of course, I went in with the casting director. I was like, I come through the right door this time. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> Jasmine, you ready to do this? And I was like, not really, but let's go for it. And we just read it. And I ran and got in the car and we went to dinner. When we come back, more with Jasmine Lewis. I built this church. You didn't build this church, God built the church. Well, it's time to break that chain. People of the world today are fading. All of us have our ups and downs. You better think about it or you won't be around. What we need is a little bit of love. Sent by one from heaven up above. Take it from T, it's simple and plain. This ain't no game, you know what I'm saying? And I didn't hear anything. I didn't think I would for months, probably two months. 
I was walking out of another audition when my phone rang and my agent said, hey, you have a meeting with um, Ice Cube for that audition that you went to. I was like, what are you talking about? It was months before. So I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. They're like, barbershop, still unclear. They said, the move with Ice Cube. I was like, oh yeah, like months ago, you have a meeting with Ice Cube. He wants to, to meet with you. I was like, mm -mm, I'm not meeting with him. I'm scared of him. Mm -mm. That's NWA. I ain't going. Because I never thought I had a shot. So I'm like, oh no, mm -mm, I'm scared of him. She was like, just go. Like she convinced me finally, just go have the meeting. I went in, he was the most lovely human being in the world. Uh, family guy, not scary in any way. Uh, and we talked and we laughed and I was on a plane like a couple weeks later for it. Cause I just knew I wasn't doing that movie. Wow. So you didn't even think you was going to get the part. No, I, who goes to an a, a audition with no makeup on your hair? Just twi wet, just twit, just dripping. Right. It's terrible. Like, I didn't wow. care. It wasn't that I didn't care. I cared so much. I didn't have a, ch a shot in my head. So it's like, I'm hungry anyway. Let's just go to dinner. That's when most of the time the best things happen when you really just don't have any you put too much on it. I think that's what right. actors do. put too much pressure on themselves. And like I had no pressure on it. it I didn't have a shot. So what's it to be up? You know, like you don't put like, oh, this could be like a life altering moment. It was a career altering moment, but I didn't know that then. So no fear. No fear. Why was you, why was you afraid of Ice Cube? <laughs> NWA. I knew all about NWA. Okay, mm -hmm. got you. So now who he was. So what happened after those movies started? I mean, obviously you blew like skyrocketed, like you did movie after movie after that. What what was your life? Like How did this. it change so drastically? What did it feel like when it changed so drastically after the first barbershop? It, nothing to change to me. It didn't change. I still have the same friends. I still do the same stuff. I still run around looking like a pack of Skittles most of the time out in the street. I don't have, I have 12 colors on most of the time. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But you make the, <laughs> you know, so you have the best parties and all the celebs come to your house. I mean, Lisa Ray, Vivica Fox, you had some good parties. I've been invited to a couple of them, but I haven't ever went, so. My parties are good, but I like to entertain. Right. I like it, you know? I enjoy it. So, yeah, I had a good part. So, so let me ask you this. What got you um, into cooking? I've been noticing your, your, your Instagram and you doing so much. That stuff be looking gourmet like a mug, man. I mean, you, you, you literally yeah. do everything. It's, it's like amazing to me how you do everything. So like, what got you? Well, first of all, how'd you learn how to cook like that? Because you cooking everything. You're not just cooking like spaghetti and biscuits and eggs. Like you cooking real stuff. What? 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 Right. I have been cooking all of my life. Cooking is my comfort. Like it's when I'm stressed out. If I just start cooking, I relax. It's instant. It's like getting massage for me. So I've been cooking all of my life. I like to eat. I'm really good at it. So I want to be able to eat what I want to eat when I want to eat it without having to go out in the street and put on colors and clothes. I don't want to do that. So I, I said, I'm just going to figure it out. And you know, cooking is about, do you love it? If you love it, you can figure it out. Like it's about, sen it's your senses. What tastes good together, you know? And let me figure out the best way to do that. So that's what I did. And then, you know, like I said, I, you were talking about how my page looks now. It's different now that we are in quarantine, but that's why it's like that because that was something I did every day, all of my life, especially now that I have a child and a husband. I cook, I cook three meals a day, every day. Wait, 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 wait. You cook three meals a day? Every day. Brian is a lucky, you know what? Man, <laughs> Jesus, Lord, help me. Three meals a day? Yes. Yeah. For real? I made, his, I made his lunch just before I sat down and tried to log on with you. I just finished it. Mm -hmm. And Christians. So they, don't that, make, they don't make women like you no more. <laughs> Man, you the last one. You probably the last one on the shelf. Last one, right? <laughs> How much is this one? You can't afford it, Carl. <laughs> 
No, that's crazy. I mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, but three <laughs> meals? Wow. Yeah. But, you know. How did you learn how to cook so well? How did you learn? There's not a whole lot I can say. I watch a lot. I, I used to watch Food Network 24-7. You either have a knack for flavors or you don't. I had a knack for flavors that go together. Anyway, I just needed to learn the best ways, you know, like putting a good flavorful something together and then cooking that piece of protein properly is two different things. So I could combine flavors. I was great at seasoning, which is why I'm doing like seasoning stuff now, because I hate when people under season their food, but I had to learn how to cook a piece of protein properly how to cook some pasta properly. Like I can make a sauce, I can make a sauce out of whatever you have in your refrigerator. Even if it's just some anchovies, some cream, and some mustard, we're gonna have a nice Dijon cream anchovy sauce. Mm. But is the pasta, like is it properly cooked? So I had to watch a lot to, to figure out how to do those, that nuance of it. But the rest of it just is, if you love it. I show how I care about a person when I cook for them. You know, like that lets you know how much I love you. I want to cook for you and I want to make it right. And I also get mad when I say this food is ready. And so I don't come when I say so. And the food gets cold. Now we've got a problem. Yeah. A lot now of I all this effort in right. and now you eating cold food. It's not how it's supposed to taste. Right. When you cook, you want it to taste the way you intended it to taste when that person eats it. So you need to eat it the way I tell you to when I tell you to. <laughs> so. Hey, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you go to right? a five-star restaurant, it's the same way right. with the chef. He That's why they, they do courses. Like They're like, okay, now, whether you're done or not, we're about to take that one because this one's ready and you need to eat it now. Like right. it's, So it's about, it's about flavor. It's about taste. And, and, and I like to see people happy. When they're, like, when they're eating, people are happy. I like to see people happy. Yeah, because I know you, you never film you eating. You always film your family eating. I think that's so... I don't, well, usually because I'm the one to find. I love to eat. I hardly ever eat my food. I hardly get, get a chance. I made some oxtails yesterday. Didn't get any. Yeah, I saw that you made a lot of it, too. Yeah. These greedy people. <laughs> so you don't like going out to eat? Is that what it is? I do, but not really. I mean... If a man was dating me to take me to a restaurant and wine and dine me, not so much. I'm not, I'm not okay. So you're Come, not impressed with that? No. I yeah. don't really like other people's food. I like mine. Or if you want to show me that you're trying to impress me, bring me to your place and cook for me. Mm. Let's go out for appetizers and drinks. And like, now we got dinner. Come on back to my house. Like, that's the perfect date. Sit down. Relax. I'm about to cook for you. In front of you. We'd be married like, man. <laughs> <laughs> but Brian didn't have to cook to do that though did, to get you did he right he didn't. Mm -mm. he didn't he didn't cook for me he still can't cook for me though poor baby he tried so what's up so Jazz what's up with these pictures you've been posted what I do wrong you didn't do nothing wrong you didn't <laughs> do nothing wrong now but they I got bored in quarantine. I was trying to help women around the world learn to be in the kitchen and cook so they don't have to starve their families and give them Doritos. So I was trying to do a, a good service. And then the interim, I was like, well, I'm really bored. Let's see how this works out. So I tried one, like a test thirst trap, and it worked out really well. So Man, that, like, thirst, that thirst trap worked so well. <laughs> I ain't ever got to drink again. <laughs> And I'm cracking you up. That's hard to do, right? <laughs> no, that's cool, man. That's cool. Well, before I wrap this up, let me just um, let me just say a couple things to you. I just want to say that I really appreciate you doing the show today, and I really appreciate your friendship. I think that you have really helped me in transition on a lot of things that I've been working on, especially with the television network and just been able to bounce stuff off. You're of doing well. I'm sorry. You're doing well. I'm doing, you know, but With you know what? Network and all that. That's just so, but you're doing it. You know I what? I applaud you for persevering and doing it. it, it I have to say you're thank better you. better than me. I don't have that kind of patience. I want to. I don't. <laughs> well, Woo! the hardest part about it is dealing with people. 
I know. And I'm, I struggle with that anyway. So it's like, I want you to do it. And then I'll just come to you and go, Hey, what are we doing now? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing. That's I was going to just really say uh -huh. one of the first, one of the first things you told me when I, when I started talking to you about me doing this, yeah. you told me, you said, look, I got you, whatever you want me to do. I got you. And a lot of celebrities, let me be honest with you. I have a lot of celebrity friends. I know. But when it comes down to coming, come on, jazz. Going up. Jazz. Going up. Right. I know. Jazz. Mm -hmm. So my thing has been, okay, I see how it goes. So, you know, rather than complain, rather than be upset, I work with what God has given me and yep. I keep building. And now I'm starting to see this, wait a minute, you know? And yep. the hardest, I heard Jamie Foxx say something one time. He says that people were treating him a little weird before he did Ray. And then after Ray, it, it all changed. Yeah. And they asked him, how do you feel about it? Like, do you feel like slighted? And he's like, no, because that's just that system. Yeah. But you have to work in your own system and just live in a place where that kind of stuff just doesn't bother you in a way. So right. when I say, huh? It can bother you, but you don't know that it affect you. It has affected me. <laughs> it used to. It used to, but not now. Like now, I'm good. Now I'm I'm really good. But it it did it did you know you get a lot of because you know what I figured out a lot of it is when they've never seen anybody do it. It's kind of like, well, how are you gonna be able to do it? <laughs> you know, like. You know, we we're having hard times with this, this, and this. So how are you just gonna come up and do it? And, and what I've true though, so, but you can understand that mentality. Oh, of course, absolutely. How do you know what I mean? Like, how do you not? I still face that a lot of times. I still face it. It is still hard for me to do a lot of certain, a lot of things because I'm walking in as a female, which is different. So I have to be bigger, better, stronger, faster than everybody in the room. So I already got like a big. You know what I mean? So sometimes, I don't know, I tell you, it gets, it gets hard. Like I, I feel like to keep fighting the same battle, sometimes I was like, well, I just want to sit back and let somebody else fight for a while. Right. I kind of did that with you. I kind of like heaped, I realized later, I was like, let me just go, you do it. Call me when we get it done. Cause I can't, I can't keep fighting the same fight right now. Right. That's how I felt. And I, Hey, publicly the show you wrote, First of all, people, she, I, I came to her about doing a show. She was down. Y'all should read these scripts. I hope, they, I hope the show gets made at some point. Even if it's not with me, I hope it gets made. Them scripts are so freaking funny. When I tell you, Jazz, you can write. Oh, my God. And Kevin Foster. I can't take anything with Kevin And Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster. Absolutely. Hilariously, hilariously funny. I like, and he's a comedian too, right? Mr. Foster's good. You know what? He is, he was not a stand up. He gave it, he's always been funny. We've been best friends for 30 years. Right. He's always been funny, but he didn't try his hand at stand up till recently and then realized he's funny that way too. Because some people can be funny in the living room, but put him on the stage and it's you no, know, you know, right. I'm a riot <laughs> in the living room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm witty, I'm quid pro quo, I got you, I'm ba boom, boom, boom. But I have never done a stand, like just standing up on stage. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't mm. disrespect the craft that bad. Right. Because it's hard. It's hard. Well, and, that, and he did. Those scripts you guys sent me or let me read or turned in or have you want to call it, say it. Man, that stuff, I still read some of that stuff. It's, it's, it's amazing. I, 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 we've got to see that show made. That I think you would be perfect in that show, and I just got to figure out how to afford you. So I'm going to get my calculator out. Hold on. <laughs> we gonna work together. I want you to do this show with us. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to do it. Would so, you say? I want you to do this show with us. We've been talking about it forever, so we may as well just get it done. We got to do it. And I really like the fact that Brian wanted to see it happen too. My Brian? Yeah. Oh yeah. Your husband. Yeah, when he ca he called me one time to talk through it, and yeah. I was like, "Oh man, he really wants to see this happen." Because you know, husbands yeah. don't play that. You know, husbands yeah. don't. But I'll tell you, Brian is a much more reasonable person than me, which is probably why we're married and doing well. Right. He is on on certain things. He is a much more reasonable, calm person. I am passionate, 
So that works for the good and for the bad. You Doesn't think- bother me that you're passionate. I actually, I love it. I love it. Well, it bothers them. It is, it, you know I, what? It, no, no, it's bad. It's bad though because I, passionate is a nice word to call me. I am passionate about what I do. I want to see people win. I'm passionate about all that. But I, I have a, 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 a short fuse, and I'm working on it. Um, but I, I, no, okay. not to beat you up, a lot of celebs have that short fuse. Yeah, and I think it has something to do with the business. I think it's just you want to get to the point. Are you full of it or are you really going to do something? Because we get strung along for so long and it's like, boom, then they drop the hammer on you and you knocked out. I was like, you could have knocked me out a long time ago. You just told me I could have avoided it. So maybe. And because I have this motto, a whole lot of people have meetings, but ain't nobody doing business. If, if, if somebody calls me to one more meeting in person, right? What are you meeting about? We that's that's one of the things I learned building this 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 network, and that is, it, it's a the reason why I'm I've gotten to this point is because a lot of people are talking, and I'm doing why they talking, and yeah. that's really what it comes down to. If you're able to do it, yeah, then that shuts down everybody's crap just like that because you're doing it. Now what are you gonna say? I did it. I mean, I, 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 it's funny how, um, how, how much you and I are a lot alike and so different because you're the same way. You're very no nonsense and yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I, that's, that's a, that's an amazing thing. Well, look, it's about time for you to go cook your next meal. So yeah, what do you want to have? <laughs> what are we going to have? What, 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 what do you, what do you want to see? I want to see you make, you know, what I want to see you make some a a nice spanish i want you to do a nice spanish night okay so anything that's authentically spanish food there's a difference between spanish and mexican i even say there's a difference between mexican and spanish food so you want a spanish meal i want to see what you do with spanish paella yeah there you go come on what what like that okay what (laughs) <laughs> no, you can do everything else like soul food. That's easy. You know, I mean, when I say easy, meaning that would be an easy request, you know, right. but right. can you do sp- Spanish food? And I also would like to see Moroccan. Well, you know, and I don't do a lot of Moroccan food. I have done some. Okay. I was on another, um, I was doing an interview just before you. Okay. And of course it, but it was a Instagram live. So people were, commenting and I, I asked at the end um a lot of people like what do you guys want to see next and I got a lot of Indian food but it's because I realized that half of my followers just figured out I'm half Indian. Yeah. They just figured that out. So I now everybody's it. like I want to curry something. You didn't know? The, no no the first time you told me you were half Indian you you took me to dinner actually in San Diego. Right, Oceanside. And it over the, exactly. And, no, yeah, it was, yeah. and I looked at you when you told me you were half Indian. I looked at you and I was like, Negro, stop lying. <laughs> and you was like, no, I'm really half Indian. And I'm like, girl, if you don't quit. not Native American. Right, I know. No, but a lot of people don't. They all automatically go, well, what tribe are you from? I'm like, I'm not that kind of, with the dog right. the feather. Right. Not that kind of Indian. I'm Native American. Not, not Native American. I'm Indian. East Indian. <laughs> so. And but I people, know, so but, you didn't believe it. But I didn't. No, I didn't. I looked at you and I was like, she's smoking crack. This girl, she's gone. They said them Hollywood women do some crazy stuff, but a whole nationality. nationality. <laughs> whole nationality change. I know. I never talked about it before, though. For years and years and years and years. And you well, know, I wasn't asked either. you're not gonna be you're gonna be mad at me, but I I can't stand Indian food. Okay, we want to cook that for you. I don't like Indian food. I don't know why. Neither. I mean, I I, don't, I almost I don't like it. It is not my favorite cuisine. Like you know, they get here's your death row meal. It's not gonna be tiki masala or anything right. curry. It's not gonna be that. Right. I'll eat it. I can make it. I'm good at it. I made it for my dad all of his life, so I'm good at it. But it's not my favorite cuisine. No. I'm just now getting into Jamaican food. Just now getting into it. You know, like, I wish I could explore more Jamaican food, like a little bit. Are, are, is it because you don't like spicy or? 
You know what it is? I don't like necessarily rice based themed meals. Meals, right? Well, not all Jamaican is rice based. It's not. But that's why I said much of it is. That's true. A lot of it is. It is, yeah. You can just get some chicken, but I'm just not. I don't know. I'm. I just don't like rice. I'm just. I have a thing about. There's only so many ways you can make rice. Right. Before it tastes like rice. <laughs> and you don't like the taste of rice. And well, fried rice. <laughs> okay, so okay. All right, I got something for you. You would like my steamed rice, and let me tell you why. What you don't like about rice is it's just white and bl- aside from fried rice, it's just steamed rice. It's just white and bland and kernels of crap in your mouth. Like it doesn't do anything. It doesn't taste like anything. I make my rice one. I don't like clumps of rice. I like it to separate. Two, I make it with chicken stock, not Mm. water, oil, and salt. So it has flavor from the moment it comes out of the pot. So you don't have to fry it. So I'm going to make you some steam. Nice. I'm going to put some braised chicken thighs with gravy over it. Oh, nice. See, now you're talking. Hold on. Get your address real quick. Hold on. (laughs) You know where I am. He was up there apparently by my house. Yeah, I was just there. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I, well, I haven't been. I haven't been to the new house, so hopefully I get to next Super Bowl. Because I'm old a Super Bowl. I know. I'm old a Super Bowl, so we got to do the Super Bowl at least one year. Hopefully next year. I don't know. We'll see. Pandemic. We have a plan. I mean, we hope. Anyway, so um, you know what? So two shows we need to talk about at some point cooking show and then the show that you wrote yes we got to finish the negotiation on that show but i think you should do a cooking show well i am kind of doing i'm i'll tell you about it later what i'm doing because the just putting it on instagram has definitely taken off you own another you got another whole business i already created it it's already (laughs) happening you may from here to approve the logo i'm not even kidding you may not need to do no more acting (laughs) It's a whole brand in itself now. Yeah, man. No, that yeah. stuff is... I'll tell you all about it. I actually have... I'll tell you all about it. I it, Look... It, changed in, it, it started out just something super simple. Just honestly, I was just trying to help women that were stuck in the house with kids that they got to feed. And they're not used to doing it. They have to go grab some McDonald's or grab some Fridays or whatever. So I'm like, okay, let me just see if I can put something out there to make something fast, like 15 to 30 minutes that somebody that doesn't cook at all can do while they're sleeping and feed their entire family. That was my original goal. And it's turned into all kinds of, you'll see, I'll tell you all about it. All right, cool. Well, I, I can't wait to, um, to have a, a meeting with you about the other show. And I think you really should really, really uh, do that. Cook, I'm gonna tell y'all that cooking stuff that you do. It's really, it's almost, um, in some weird way, relaxing to watch. Oh, thank you. A lot of people have chimed in and said that to me. I've gotten so many, like, emails about that. As a it's matter of fact. oddly relaxing to watch it. I don't know why. <laughs> as a matter of fact, the reason why I text you, honestly, to even, because, you know, I, I, I rarely ask my celeb friends to do this show. Right. Politics, the whole thing. I don't want to, you know. But I asked you to do this show because of your cooking. I was so, like, I, I, was, I had so much respect for you, for the fact that you really enjoy doing this for your family, that for me, that was like, I have to ask her to do my show because I feel like this is a side of her I didn't know, I didn't see. You know what I mean? And it, really made, no, that's it true. really made me look at you at a higher level of respect. Not that I didn't, but I always looked at you, you know, respectfully. But, but to see how you interact with your husband and your son and how much your son is so nice and, and, and just an amazing kid, I was like, that's, that's good parenting. That's good mommy. Thank you. You know what I mean? Thank you. So I, I really, I really um, think you should do something with that cooking. I'm, it's really, it, I've, I had caught myself doing meetings or if I had a rough day with advertisers or whatever, I would just go to your video and watch and I, it would just calm me. You're not the first one that said that. That's funny that you say that 
um, because I, you know, the other people that are commenting, I can't see them. I don't know them, but I'd like to hear you say that, like a lot of people have said it. I was like, it's calming. One lady said she was afraid of the kitchen and she got in there with one of my simple recipes and she did it and her family loved it. And she said, I just want to say thank you because I'm no longer afraid to go into the kitchen. Like just, those were very powerful words because she was very sincere. Like she, she got three kids, little, younger kids, like, like, like five, nine and 12 or something like that. And it's like, how do you, like you're, she was afraid of the kitchen. And I realized, cause I told Brian, I was like, I'm not just like giving people like some ideas of like some recipes here or there, but it's changing people. And that, that means a lot to me. It is changing people. And I'm gonna tell you why it's changing people because you're not just doing it for likes. You're not doing it from a cookbook. You're not doing it as a pilot for a show. You're just doing it because you love your family. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is just like such a, you know, not to compare you to Paula Dean, but to me, that was one of the things that made people watch her show. They love seeing her cook for her husband. I think that was her husband. That was her husband. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you felt that feeling of, I think every woman and every husband or wife, I should say, that dynamic, everybody wants that feeling. Yeah. The, 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 one, the, one, the wife wants to feel appreciated for her time and effort, and then the husband wants to enjoy what she's created for him. Yes. Like that whole concept has been lost in, 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 in pilots and, and lights. And, and so you kind of took all of that away unknowingly. Right. And, and it became kind of its own thing. And that's usually the birth of a billion dollar, multi billion dollar business, which I want 20% of that. So. <laughs> I'll be here, Red. I'll be here. <laughs> anyway, Jazz, thank you. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I have much respect for you. And thank you for doing the Carl Jackson podcast. I love it. Thank you for watching us this week. And until next time, you have a great and prosperous week. Peace.